just a big word that means good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ, God came down in the flesh and lived a perfect life, died for your sins and mine. That is the truth. He was buried and he was raised again. We have a text to stand for. That is the Bible. The Bible is where we get the truth from. Today, we want to talk about that for the fact that we have a testimony to stand for. A testimony to stand for. You know, court cases are won or lost based on some things. First of all, the evidence that is presented, and also the credibility, or if you will, the reliability 
of the witness's testimony. One who is disingenuous or who is uncertain can persuade a judge and jury only to doubt the authenticity of the witness. Jesus told us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in all Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Some of us are reliable witnesses, and some of us are unreliable witnesses. But he said, ye shall be my witnesses. In other words, you're going to be my witnesses. He didn't say you're going to be my good witnesses. Now, he did say that we would have his power with us. What does his power give us? It gives us boldness to be his witness. So, in order for us to have get, to tap into that power, we must know whom we have believed. And uh, people around us, even unbelievers, will know uh, if we don't really believe. They're going to be able to tell if you are disingenuous, if you are an unreliable or a false witness. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So why did the Apostle Paul and why did the other apostles, though apostle, by the way, is just a big word for sent ones who were sent. Why did the apostles continue in the face of so much persecution, so much suffering, so much opposition? Because they were reliable witnesses of the risen Lord. And they understood that this life is not all there is. First Corinthians chapter 15, I want to kind of begin today, our focal passage will be especially verses 5 through 8, but I, I want to read verses 3 and 4 again because they give us context uh, for these other uh, four verses. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five Hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So let's look at the order of it. Jesus appeared after he was, after he died on the cross for our sins, he was buried, he laid in the tomb three days and three nights, he rose again, he was seen, Jesus appeared first uh, to Peter, Cephas, that's who Cephas is, Peter. Then to the 12, that is the rest of the uh, disciples minus 
uh, Judas, who had already gone away. Then to more than 500 people, 500 witnesses. And these 500 witnesses, by the way, Paul wrote there, and we must understand the context of this. He said, you can go ask many of them because they're still around. Well, remember that this, the context of this is that, that Paul was writing at the, at the time of he wrote this, many of them were still alive. Uh, and of course, we know that now they have all uh, fallen asleep. And don't uh, uh, discount that, that word there that he used, the, the phraseology that he used there fallen asleep. He didn't say they died. He said they fell asleep. And uh, the, the of course, the uh, upshot of that is if you fall asleep, you're going to do what? You're going to wake up. They're going to wake up. And we're all going to wake up because he is risen. Then to James. Who's James? Uh, most likely, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who did not believe in him at all. Uh, while he was uh, on the earth, and he did, he did not believe in James nor none of Jesus's uh, brethren or uh, sisters believed uh, that he was who he said he was until after he was risen. And uh, this James, by the way, probably uh, wrote the epistle of James and also is the pillar of the Jerusalem church, one of the elders and probably the leader of the Jerusalem church. And to the other Apostles. Now notice here that Paul puts himself at the end of the list. He's not doing that because of false humility. In verse 8, he calls himself one born out of time. What does he mean by born out of time? The, the language here suggests that he was a, that he considered himself to be a miscarriage or uh, to put it in a, even, a, a, and maybe even a stronger term there, an abortion. That's the way he, that's the way that the, the language is here. Uh, and, uh, he considered himself to be a miscarriage or, or a child who didn't live or, or, or a child who was taken from his mother's womb before the time he should have been. Now he's referring to himself that way so that he, we can understand, uh, truly how he, um, understood, uh, he, the, the way that he had been uh, brought in to be an apostle, Paul of all people, a persecutor of the church. So why did why did Paul um, consider himself that way? Well, we see the answer in the in the very next verse, First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse nine. For I am the least of the apostles. Why? <laughs> that am not meet to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. Paul is saying, every day I wake up in the morning and, and I cannot believe that God has saved me because of what I did to him, what I did to his son, what I've done to his people. And yet here I am. This is not false humility. Paul's attitude of self-worthlessness prepared him, listen carefully, prepared him for service to God. Did you know that? Paul considered himself to be worthless and useless to God, and that prepared him to be useful to God. There's a great hymn that we sing of the faith of old, it's an old song, uh, it's called Rock of Ages. And uh, <clears throat> we get these the words from that hymn. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That is an attitude that should resound in the heart of every believer. That's just amazing. Nothing and my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I want you to, I want to ask you a question. Do you think of yourself as worthless and useless to God? I can't sing very good. I can't 
teach very good. I can't talk very good. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. You, you consider yourself to be useless, worthless to God. Good. Now you are ready to be an effective witness and servant in surrendered obedience to him. Because now he can use you because you have realized that you are totally dependent upon him to do what he has called you and equipped you to do. Second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse nine. This is one of my life verses. <laughs> you know, some people just have their favorite verses. This is probably my, if I had to just had to say this is one verse uh, in all of scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Listen to it. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For, the, for my or for force, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you know what God desires from you? What does God really want from you? Your money, your time, your talent? What does God really want from you? What, do you, what, what does God really want from you? You ever thought about that? More than anything else, he wants you. He wants you. He wants an abiding, meaningful, deep, intimate relationship with you. Because see, once you have that, from that, out of that, through that, will flow all of your time, your talent, and your treasure. So the question is, what are you going to do with that, what are you going to do with the, the fact that God wants you? And you know, what, what does God want you to do? Well, would you be willing to stand in a dark world and be a reliable witness and turn on your light and give reliable testimony for Christ? Would you be willing to do that? Jesus close to the end of his ministry, wrote these words in the Gospel of John chapter 9 in verses 4 and 5. These are words that he said of himself, but I believe in every fiber of my being that these words apply to everyone within the sound of my voice if you are born again child of God. John chapter 9 verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to be the light in the world while you're in the world. The world is getting darker every day. And the darker the world gets, the lighter, the brighter the light shines. Hal Lindsey relates an account of a local church in an Eastern Bloc country before the Iron Curtain fell, where Christians met in secret course, to worship God. The packed service had just begun when the door burst open and in rushed several KGB agents, brandishing their machine guns. Their leader proclaimed to the congregation that they had five minutes to leave. Anyone who was left Inside, after that time, would be shot. There was a silence punctuated only by the ticking of the clock and the anxious breathing 
of the people. Then, by ones and twos, people begin to leave the service. At the end of the time limit, there were just a few people left in the room. The agents turned to the assembled congregation, raised their weapons, and then they lowered them. The leader explained, we wanted to worship the Lord, but we only wanted to worship with true believers. If you had been in that room that day, would you have been still there at the end of the five minute time limit or would you be one of the people who left and missed the blessing of true worship? Why won't people stand for anything anymore? It's because they, they will fall for anything and everything. Judges chapter 21 in verse 25 describes the condition of our world very well. In those days, there, were no, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's true for the world. But what about the church? I mean, the world doesn't know Jesus. Of course, they're going to do everything that's right in their own eyes. They don't have the, the guidance. They don't have an understanding that they have some semblance of, at least at first, of what's right and wrong before they completely lose that ability to understand uh, what a moral compass is and what true north is morally. But what about the church? Why don't the church, why don't, why don't church members stand for God? anymore. Could it be that it is because most church members, not all, but most church members don't really believe what God says? Could that be what's going on? The father of a boy who had a devil made a wise request when he prayed these words in Mark chapter nine, verse 24. And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. What will you stand for? What do you really believe? Because you know what you'll stand for? What you believe. And that's true. What you really believe, that's what you'll stand for. Do you believe God? I didn't say, do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But do you believe what God says? Would you ask him to help your unbelief? Lord, there are areas in my life that I see in my spirit. You're revealing, you're showing it to me that I don't really believe you. Lord, help thou mine unbelief. We have a truth to stand for. We have a text to stand for. We have a testimony to stand for. A knock comes at your door, you open it, and it's someone from the sheriff's office and he is delivering your subpoena to appear. Are you ready to stand and be a reliable witness for God? Now in fairness, I must say that you can't be a witness of something you have not experienced. If you have not experienced God, if you have not experienced a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you can't be expected to be a witness. You can't be a witness to something that hasn't happened to you. 
So how do you become a witness? Understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Understand that there's the consequences of that. The wages of sin is death. But understand this, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that the Lord has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever called upon the Lord to be saved after realizing that you are a sinner? If you have not done that, do it right now, and guess what? You are going to be a reliable witness in God's kingdom and for his work. Let's pray. Father, we ask you that you would sink this message deep in the hearts of all of your people and all of those who are not yet your people. Lord, that your gospel message, your truth, your text, and the testimonies of all of us, Father, would go throughout this world in the very last hour that we are here. Father, we do understand that, that we must work for the night is coming when no man can work. And right now, we're the light of the world. We are the, that generation that shall not pass. Lord, would you help us to be bold? Would you it, refill us, Father, with the power, the boldness that we need to be the reliable witnesses, the authentic witnesses that we need to be in these days. In Jesus' name, amen.